for being here. My name is Nitita Gassal and I'm the founder of the Trauma Conscious Yoga Institute. Today we're going to talk a little bit about intergenerational trauma and resiliency. As we're preparing to begin, I'd like to invite you to connect to your body for a moment. and really just allow yourself to arrive here in this space to learn, to be curious, and to heal. And if it feels right, taking a full breath in and out. Okay. So why don't we start with what trauma is in general, and then we'll get into intergenerational trauma more specifically. So generally speaking, what is trauma? So we have a basic survival need as human beings to feel a sense of safety and security, to feel that we have control over our body and that we are able to keep our body safe and the bodies of our loved ones safe. Trauma is not an event or experience itself, but trauma is the nervous system's response to an event where it perceives that it is not able to keep itself safe, right? So when the body perceives danger and an inability to keep itself safe, oftentimes we will experience trauma. Right? So examples of situations that will oftentimes lead to trauma responses in the nervous system are physical assault, right? sexual assault, childhood physical abuse, childhood sexual abuse, being involved or located at a war zone, right? um, being held up at gunpoint, um, being part of a natural disaster, right, or being involved or exposed to a natural disaster like a earthquake or a hurricane, right? And so oftentimes the primary emotion here that we feel is fear, and usually there's also a felt sense of powerlessness or helplessness, right? And that's where that perceived inability to keep oneself safe comes in, right? So again, trauma is the body's response to a situation that it perceives as life-threatening or horrifying, right? So there's also systemic trauma, right? Systemic trauma is the trauma that is built into the very infrastructures of our society, right? Um, many of us spiritually really understand that we are all connected, right? That we're all one. Um, if you look at all of our DNA, research will show that all of our DNA, the DNA of every human being can be traced back to a single African ancestor, a single African female ancestor. We are literally all one, right? But because of trauma responses, because of survival responses and fear, fear around lack of resources, fear around scare, scarcity, fear around loss of power. Um, laws and regulations and legislation have intentionally been put into place to create a hierarchy and to give certain people more value, right? Certain people's lives are given more value and certain people's lives are devalued. And therefore people that have a life that is given more value have certain advantages, right? So when we look at systemic trauma, we're looking at the trauma that is experienced by way of being um, belonging to a group that is identified as inferior in some way, right? So black, indigenous, and people of color experience systemic trauma on some level, right? There are literally laws put into place to keep us separate from the dominant society and not experiencing the same advantages, right? Some of these laws are very subtle, right? And we're gonna talk about this a little bit in just a moment. 
Then there are laws that are more um, obvious and in your face. So for example, now it's legal in all states in the United States for LGBTQ plus community to marry, right? But gay marriage was illegal for a long time. So that is a legislation that is very explicit, right? Oftentimes when we look at legislation, however, um, that creates systemic barriers for certain groups, it's more implicit, it's more secret, right? We have things like gerrymandering, we have um, lack of access to resources, we have, there's a lot of stuff, right? I could go on for forever, right? But systemic trauma is ongoing, um, there's no end until we dismantle a lot of these systems that create it. Okay, so what is intergenerational trauma then? So intergenerational trauma is the trauma that we literally inherit or pass down from one generation to the next. So part of my healing personally as a woman of the African diaspora, um, as a self-identified African-American woman, um, has been in reviving and learning about and connecting to and evoking the traditional spiritual and healing practices of my ancestors in pre-colonial Africa. So I'm talking about my ancestors that lived in indigenous tribal village community. Um, and in studying my ancestors and their spiritual beliefs and practices, I've learned a couple things. One, the traditional African spiritual beliefs and philosophy are in direct alignment with yogic philosophy. They're pretty much the same. Um, and two, that my ancestors really understood the wisdom that lives in the body. They were very connected to nature and through nature connected to spirit. They were very connected to their bodies and respectful of their body's inner experience. And they were soulful, spiritual people, and they revered their ancestors because they understood that memory lives in the body. They understood that there is a wellspring of wisdom in the body and that we inherit you know, that the blood carries data, right? And so from mother to offspring, there is data that we are inheriting in this lifetime. And that this lifetime is not only about healing ourselves, but also healing the ancestors that didn't have a chance to fully heal, as well as healing ourselves so that future generations do not inherit the pain and the trauma. Right? It's been incredibly empowering for me to study traditionist, uh, traditionist, indigenous traditional African spirituality. Now in the West, we tend to distrust the body or minimize the importance of the body except for how it looks, right? We, we care about how the body looks, we tend to ignore the body's inner wisdom, and we even take all types of medications and drugs and things to further disconnect ourselves from the body's experience. In the West, we like to have logic and facts and research and everything needs to be evidence-based. Okay, I'm not saying that's totally negative, but you know, there, there's a lack of balance with that. But with that, all that, uh, all that I wanna say is that there is research that shows that we inherit um, experiences from our ancestors. There's a field called epigenetics. Um, and basically, when we experience um, something stressful in this lifetime, then our DNA, uh, the expression of our DNA, are altered to reflect those stressful experiences. So we have stress genes, right, that are um, impacted and then passed down to offspring. And I'll give you some links about epigenetics here for those who are interested. I know we like research and science in the West and that's okay. Um, but basically the field of epigenetics uh, shows through science, right, that gene expression is altered with exposure to chronic stress and those altered expressions of the genes are passed down to offspring. All right, so this is the way that trauma is inherited and passed down from one generation to the next. 
So when we look at intergenerational trauma, you know, we're looking at both individual families sometimes, but also we're looking at collective society as a whole, which is more my area of interest. But first, for those who are interested, looking at individual families, you know, as far as intergenerational trauma goes, what that may look like is, you know, um, if there was a lot of abuse um, in your grandmother's family growing up, if as a child your grandmother experienced lots of abuse, physical, sexual, whatever the case may be, then you know that altered the expression of her genes and if she did not receive any help or anything to resolve that trauma, she's going to pass that down to your either mother or father, right? And then there is a likelihood that mother or father, because the genes are altered slightly, will experience some negative health impacts, could be psychological, could be physical, more than likely both because they're interrelated. And if your parent didn't do anything to heal or gain any resolution there, then that will continue to be passed down. All right, so this is how it gets passed down along family lines individually. Now there are things we can do to heal and stop the cycle, uh, and we're going to get to that. But first, let me go to more of a collective framework around intergenerational trauma. Now this is what's really interesting to me, right? Our history as a people, right, when we understand that we are really all interconnected, that we are all one, we start to get interested about the collective intergenerational trauma that we're all inheriting, right? A lot of us look at society nowadays and we, we can observe a divide, right? And one way to look at this divide is politically, right? There are people that have more conservative political beliefs, there are people that have more liberal political beliefs, there's a whole spectrum and range, right? But oftentimes we see uh, a division that's pretty clear cut to a degree, right? So how are we holding all of this as a collective? Well, ultimately, when when there's a group of us that are not free, none of us are really free, right? We're all seeking freedom. The human spirit strives for freedom, right? And so we have like the 1%, like the wealthiest people in power who a lot of us may think, oh, they have a great life, they're free, they have money, they have power. But with power does not come freedom because with power does not come peace. Um, what I witness is that a lot of people with power and wealth are preoccupied by fear and fear of losing that power and wealth. And they're in a trauma response. They're perceiving a threat, right? Even when there maybe isn't a threat there or when the threat is smaller than the threat that they're perceiving, right? And I mean, I'll get into it, right? Like the um, idea that immigrants and people of color are going to steal all the resources from the 1%, right? That is an example of the lack of freedom and the, the level of fear that people are living in, right? We, again, we have systems in place that keep us separate from one another, that keep some of us experiencing certain advantages and others of us experiencing certain disadvantages, right? So if we go all the way back to the 1600s, we will see that race was a human invention. In the 1600s, race was invented by wealthy European landowners who were in fear, right? They perceived a threat to their safety and security. At this point, there was no race. So there were indentured servants from the Netherlands and Great Britain and Africa who were all uprising as a union against the wealthy European landowners because again, indentured servants weren't free and the human spirit fights for freedom. So in experiencing these uprises, the wealthy European landowners came up with an intentional plan. And this was the beginning of white supremacy. So the plan was to identify the European indentured servants and themselves as white and to identify the African indentured servants as black and to create a divide, right? So telling the African indentured servants, you are black, you're nothing like us, right? And telling the 
European indentured servants, you are white. You are like us. We'll even give you a little bit of land, right? Just enough land so that the indentured servants would pledge their allegiance to the wealthy white landowners and not uprise against them, right? And oftentimes these indentured servants who were identified at this point as white were also given jobs as overseers. So they had jobs managing and overlooking the work of the black indentured servants who would eventually become slaves, right? So this was a work of evil genius, a trauma response to maintain a sense of safety and security, right, in the, the conscious of the wealthy white landowners. And it wasn't long afterward that systems and laws and legislation were put in place to keep black and people of color bound and to ideally liberate people of um, European descent or who were then identified as white. So what we see is that way back in our history, right, there was an intentional division created amongst people, right, by way of trauma response, right, by way of a perceived threat to the security and st uh, stability and control of people who had power, okay? And unfortunately, as a collective, as a society, we have not yet been successful in dismantling that divide, right? The systems that were put in place back in the 1600s, the legislation that literally like gave some people advantages while other people were given disadvantages and loss of control and loss of freedom over their body and their human experience. Right? We have not resolved all this, right? We, we come to modern time and a lot of us, right, because spiritually we, we understand at a deep soulful level that we are all one, right? A lot of us are wanting to connect and join together as, as though we are all one. The problem is we are not all being treated as one and we have to resolve the past in order to move forward, right? Spiritually, right, yoga is a practice that teaches us that we are all one. Yoga is about unity and connection, right? Um, and this was the same understanding that my ancestors and many of your ancestors in indigenous Africa had, right? That we are all one. We are literally all one, right? Fun fact, if you didn't know this, that all of our DNA, the DNA of every living being on this planet, can be traced back to a single female African ancestor, right? Many of you know that we all had roots in Africa, right? We all literally, the DNA that we contain in our body can be traced back to a single female African ancestor. We are literally all one. The problem is the way that our society is set up, we are not all treated as one. Right, so with that divide, we're not able to excel spiritually the way that our souls really want to, right? We come to this life to serve a purpose, right? And it's a purpose of service, it's a purpose of connection and selfless service, which we call seva in yoga, right? But we're not able to live into our spiritual destiny if there's this divide and there's this chaos and there's this conflict. conflict. You know, so it's in all of our best interest to support the collective healing and the collective resolution of this intergenerational trauma that we've inherited as a society and as a human race. Right. So in a future video, I will begin to talk about ways that we can heal from intergenerational trauma, and I do have other resources um, online about this as well, but I will create a video up here for YouTube around how we can begin to heal. But part of that, the first step of healing from any type of trauma, but particularly intergenerational trauma, is understanding resiliency, right? Resiliency 
speaks to the human spirit's striving to persevere and evolve and grow even in the midst of adversity and stress and trauma, right? Our human spirit strives for freedom, it strives for connection, right? It strives for uh, love and spiritual growth and evolution, right? And the human spirit will continue to strive for all of those things until it's been so badly broken that it cannot anymore, right? When we talk about, you know, that our expression of our DNA has been altered by the stress and the trauma that we've inherited from previous lifetimes and the stress and the trauma that we've experienced in this lifetime, Oftentimes when people hear that, they can start to feel a little disheartened, right? Because many people start to think, oh my gosh, well that's like a life sentence. I want to let you know that our bodies are so resilient and able to evolve and grow that it is not a life sentence. Just because you've inherited trauma and that's impacted you on a hormonal and cellular level does not mean that you are doomed, right? So for those of you who do like research, there's research that actually shows that one, with conscious intention alone, we can start to heal and positively reform the gene expressions and the DNA that have been negatively altered by way of inherited trauma, trauma and stress, right? So, Simply by creating the intention, right? There's a lot of power in intention and what we put out energetically simply by setting the intention and elevating our consciousness, right? That we are here to do healing work, that we are here to transform the legacy. That positive attitude, right? And the shift in belief that it brings about and therefore the residual impact it has on our body can bring about positive change within the brain and the neural pathways and the expression of our genes. There's also research that shows that adopting embodiment practices, practices that get you connected to your body, like dance, right, or yoga, or mindfulness meditation, integrating those healing practices into your regular life will also start to positively transform the gene expression and the neural pathways in your brain, right? So we really truly don't have to continue this legacy of trauma, right? And disconnection and division between ourselves. If we can set the intention, one, to consciously do something about this and heal, and two, we can act on that and adopt the practices that will help us heal. So the practices I mentioned just now, you know, they're more individual practices when we're looking at mindfulness or yoga or dance, right? In the future video on healing, I will also speak to how we heal collectively as well, right? Because again, the trauma we've inherited as a human race um, has been collective and we need to heal collectively, right? None of us are free until all of us are free, right? So there are activities that we can do in community and in connection to one another that can support healing as well. So stay tuned for that. One other thing I wanted to share with you uh, before I go today is a couple of the offerings um, being offered by the Trauma Conscious Yoga Institute that relate to intergenerational trauma and healing. So many of you know that one of the primary offerings here at the Trauma Conscious Yoga Institute is our 25-hour certification training in the Trauma Conscious Yoga Method. This is a training that will teach you how to use trauma-informed yoga and embodiment practices to both support your own healing and it'll help you to support others in their healing, right? So some people come primarily to support their own healing, but a lot of mental health professionals come who want to use trauma-informed yoga in their work with clients. And a lot of yoga teachers will come who want to use trauma-informed yoga in their teaching work, 
right? So that's an offering that a lot of you know about. We have those trainings in person. We tour around the United States with those trainings. We also have an online training in the Trauma Conscious Yoga Method. But now I'm excited to announce to you that at the Trauma Conscious Yoga Institute, we have a new offering. It's a healing workshop called the, uh, Transforming the Legacy, Healing Intergenerational Trauma in the Body, Mind, and Soul. So this is a three hour workshop that involves one hour of education. So in that educational hour, we will go more in depth than we did today around what is intergenerational trauma, how do we accumulate it, and how do we heal, and how do we tap into our body's resiliency to support that healing. And then the second part of the workshop, the second two hours, is we've got live drummers. We're gonna get into our bodies and we're actually going to heal. We're going to share in um, a circle with the community of people who have gathered with us, why we're here, what our intention is. We're going to move, we're going to breathe, I'm going to offer you meditations and journal prompts and contemplative practices to support your healing. And we're even going to get into some West African dance and really move our bodies to beats and to rhythms that help us to metabolize and mobilize out of us any trapped tension and energy that we've been holding, right? Those of you who have been reading trauma discourse for a while know that you can't talk your way through trauma, you've got to move it out. Trauma is stored in the nervous system and in the body. So these workshops, Transforming the Legacy, Healing Trauma, or Healing Intergenerational Trauma in the Body, Mind, and Soul are to be a really cathartic, healing, transformative experiences. Um, in October 2019, we're doing on October 12th a workshop in Maryland right out of DC. Uh, we're doing a workshop in Atlanta on October 19th. We're going to do one out here in Austin on February 22nd. Um, just stay tuned, sign up for the newsletter at traumaconsciousyoga.com so that you know when future training dates and tour dates are announced. The other thing I wanted to share with you is that I am currently writing a book, my first book that I'm writing, and it's on healing intergenerational trauma. And again, tapping into our resiliency and innate healing potential. And we will be looking at indigenous practices, um, African spirituality, yoga, and many different methods that help us to decolonize our healing. Um, and reconnect to our bodies, minds, hearts, and souls mission and life purpose in being here. So those are some offerings that are coming up at the Trauma Conscious Yoga Institute. I hope you'll stay tuned. I hope you'll stay connected. Feel free to reach out if you have any questions or thoughts. And I really thank you all for being here. Namaste. Mm -hmm.